So I got a question. Anybody tired? Anybody a little bit sleepy? Yeah, uh, what comes to mind for you when I give you this phrase, okay? Ready for this? I'm alive in your spirits. Three-day weekend, huh? Yeah, yeah, you go automatically. You're like 10 years old, it's elementary school again, and you found out there was a teacher work day. You're like, I don't know what they do, but I don't care. Because we don't have school on Friday or we don't have school on Monday. I love that my birthday, just in case you were wondering, is January 17th. And that almost always corresponded with Martin Luther King weekend for me. And it wasn't about civil rights for me. I'm sorry, I wasn't a good enough person. It meant that normally I had a three-day weekend on my birthday, and that was awesome. Except the year that I uh, got my driver's license and uh, DMV was closed. And that was, I didn't like that. Um, but three-day weekend, here, okay, what if I told you today, your job, your occupation, the place where you work, had decided to go to a four-day work week from now on. Yeah, oh man, you would jump up and down, you would be like, whatever happy dance you do, the cabbage patch, the raise the roof, like whatever your dance is that makes you awkward when you're happy, you'll be doing that dance because you have a three-day weekend. And here's what you would do. As soon as you got done dancing, I'm gonna go ahead and call it, you would begin to decide what you're gonna do on that extra day. First thing I'm gonna do is what? Sleep, I heard five people say sleep. You're gonna sleep in, okay, you're gonna sleep, but it's gonna be every week, so you can spread it out, so once a month you might play some golf. Some of you, some of you might be like, I need to go to the beach more often. We live at the beach, and I haven't been in four years. I should go to the beach more often. I'm gonna do some shopping, I'm gonna do some work on my house that I've been needing to do, or my car, these, these projects that I've been putting off. I'm gonna do the laundry without being stressed out. I'm gonna read a book. You haven't read a book in 15 years, but you are gonna read a book, and all of a sudden, before you know it, that extra day of your weekend is gone. You planned it. It's fully planned, and you know what you're going to do. Today, we're wrapping up our, our, our teaching series we've been calling Good Work, Finding Purpose in My 9 to 5. And it's been a really cool journey because, you know, reports show that people in general are dissatisfied with their job. Whatever your job is, your 9 to 5, it might be a more traditional 9 to 5. You might, you might be a stay-at-home parent. You might be uh, retired. You might be an entrepreneur, so you're st- you might work on shift work, whatever it is. But you've got this thing, it's your occupation, and over and over it's reported like, I don't like my job, and, and we long for the weekends. Or you get a little pep in your step when you realize it's almost five o'clock. <laughs> yeah, oh, nope, not taking one more order. We're gonna go and lock the door, like, because we're done. We're finished. When we know it's Friday, we have a little party inside, don't we? It's awesome. I had this amazing feeling on Thursday when we were done with Thanksgiving. We had all the food, the football. Don't talk, I don't want to talk about the Cowboys game. Like it was, it was like a lot. And it, but you know what? I think it was my wife or my sister-in-law was like, ah, tomorrow's Friday. And I realized like, what? Like it's only Thursday today? Like it felt like Saturday. But we had an extra weekend. It was awesome. But this is what happens. We have our weekend. We have our five o'clock. We have our sometimes three-day weekends or whatever. But for some reason, we show back up at work on Monday and we're like, mm. Do you do that? I think you do. You do it either inside or outside. You do that, and you don't feel any more rested. You don't feel any more rejuvenated. You don't feel like you got a weekend. You just feel like it's Monday, and I don't want to be here again. And you start to count the days till when? The weekend. And we work for the weekend. And so in this series, we've been kind of going through What's the purpose of work? Why do we do it? In week one, we talked about God's purpose for work, his design for it all. In week two, we looked at how we can take our vocation and we can turn it into a calling. Uh, Last week, we talked about cultivating a God-honoring heart with what we do with our paycheck. And it's been a really cool look at this majorly important part of our life because something like 90,000 hours of our lives are spent, about a quarter of our best, like most energetic times of our life are spent on the job. And so what does God have to say about that? Well, we always look to the Bible to find out the answers to that question. We're going to be in the Bible some this week, and, and this week as we kind of get plugged in, we're going to do something fun, all right? I want you to all grab your time card. I want you to slip it into that Fred Flintstone thing where he would clock out and there'd be like the big dinosaur that would bite it. You remember that thing? We're going to clock out this morning, okay? We're going to clock out and ask ourselves this question. What do we do with that time when we're not at work? Those sweet, magical moments between getting off of work and going back to work. And does God have anything to say to that? Here's the thing. I believe that one of the reasons we come back to work so beat on Mondays is because there is a better way to rest. And maybe we need to learn that. And I believe that God has actually instructed us on that. 
So we're going to be in the Bible, and I'm going to teach us a word today. It's a good Bible word. The word is Sabbath. You know the word Sabbath? You've probably heard it. It comes from the, the, the Hebrew uh, word, which means to cease or to stop, okay? Uh, it's not, maybe you're like me, you grew up, and for you, Sabbath was just a churchy word for Sunday. Like, you're like, I'm going to go to Sabbath today. Uh, in fact, I don't know how it happened, but somewhere along the line, I think I had a Sunday school teacher tell me once that, like, Sabbath used to be the name that the Jews used for Saturday, back, back before Jesus came. But then, after Jesus, God changed the name of Sunday to Sabbath, and I'm sure that they meant well when they taught me that, but that's not true. I don't know where that came from. Uh, and, but we get this idea at Sabbath, it's not a day of the week. It can be a day of the week, but Sabbath isn't a day of the week. Sabbath is a discipline. It's a practice. It's a thing to do, or rather not to do, because the word means to stop, or to rest, or to cease. Sabbath is kind of like leg day at the gym. Like if you skip leg day on Tuesday, it's cool. You can do it on Thursday. That's fine. No big deal. But if you never do leg day, you'll look like me when I put shorts on. Like that's, you will not get the benefits of leg day if you never do leg day. And the same thing's true with Sabbath. If we don't practice it, if we don't use it as a discipline, if we don't put it in our lives regularly, we will never understand the rest that God has for us. And so let's talk about that today. So we're gonna be in the Bible. I wanna get you to grab a Bible. We're gonna be in two major verses today, uh, the book of Genesis and the book of Deuteronomy. If you don't have a Bible today, that's totally cool. We've got some free ones we give away on the silver shelf over here by the door. So please grab one before you leave today. Uh, look it up on your phone if you want to. And we're just going to be uh, looking through this concept of Sabbath and what does God's word say about it. So uh, if you have got the Bible, we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 20. I'm sorry, not Genesis, Exodus chapter 20. That's the second book of the Bible, Genesis, then Exodus. And if you want to go and thumb over to Deuteronomy, we're also going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5. And while you're looking and before we read that, let's make sure we're on the same page. with What is, what is Sabbath? Uh, well, Sabbath is a practice of the Jewish people. And Sabbath has been observed for over 30 centuries. It's a really, really old discipline. Christians have practiced it more loosely since Christianity came around about 2,000 years ago. Uh, Different groups do Sabbath in different ways. The Bible actually doesn't seem to be as concerned with how we do Sabbath, like exactly what you do when you Sabbath. It really doesn't. There's not any exact uh, descriptions of what you should do from wake up to go to bed on your Sabbath time. As it is concerned with it, we understand the meaning and the purpose behind Sabbath. The very basic idea is this. Like if you were to go to today to a, 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 a traditional Jewish home that is Sabbath observant, uh, the basic definition of Sabbath is this, that every person should set aside a day in their week in which instead of working, they rest and worship God. That's the, that's the like bullet pointed little, like you could tweet that, and that's kind of what Sabbath is. Uh, For example, today, if you were to go to this traditional Jewish uh, Sabbath observant home, you might find that they would prepare all day on Friday to get ready for their Sabbath rest of the day. And so on that, on that Friday, they would actually prepare all of their meals for the next day. They would prepare, uh, they would get their chores done. They wouldn't mow the grass on Saturday. They'd try to get that done when they get home from work on Friday night. Or may, maybe they'd get off a little early to get some of those chores done. They'd get all the working stuff done. And then around sundown, uh, because in the Jewish calendar, the next day actually begins when the sun goes down that day. And so like when sun goes down tonight, it'd actually be tomorrow. They would do something really cool. They would probably light some candles or they would sit around a table and they would share a meal together. They would sing some songs together and they would pray together and they would read God's word together. And then tomorrow morning on Saturday, they would wake up and they would go to synagogue together and they would hear some teaching of the word and they would take the day to rest and enjoy each other's company and they would Sabbath. That's kind of what it means. And uh, not all Sabbaths look just like that. Um, Jewish culture has been around for centuries, evolving that Sabbath. And so as you look at different groups, they kind of do it different ways. And more recently, for Christians, it has meant going to church on Sunday. That really is part of a Christian's observation of Sabbath. That's a good thing. It's why you can't go to Chick-fil-A today, uh, because it's Sunday, and in their values, they've decided to take a day where they close their business one day a week to, observe, to allow their employees to enjoy, enjoy and observe Sabbath. And so but the question is, where did it all begin, and what does it mean to us today? Okay, so we're going to be in those two passages, uh, Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5, and the reason is because these are the two places where we read the Ten Commandments, okay, Ten Commandments, God's ten most important instructions to the nation of Israel as he gets their nation going. Uh, They've just recently gotten out of slavery in Egypt, and they're moving out on their own, and God is kind of instructing them how to build this nation, and the first time we see it is in Exodus chapter 20, and these are like God's most important things that he wants us to know. He says things like, don't worship false gods, don't worship idols, don't lie. 
Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery. Honor your parents. We're actually gonna have a whole study through the Ten Commandments next summer. I'm looking forward to that because these things still apply to us today. And in this list of really important things, check out what Exodus 20 verse eight says. This is God's most important list. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. The six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons or your daughters or your male and female servants or your animals or your foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the Sabbath, on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Sabbath, to cease, to stop. This series has been about work, and it's been about how we can partner with God in the things he's doing in this world to model our lives after how he works and how he operates. And work is a very important thing to God. He's creative, and he's always working in the world. But another part that's really important to God is Sabbath. This first mention of Sabbath that we just read, Exodus chapter 20, um, it, it ends, if you look in verse 11, it calls back to the very beginning minutes of time. And in verse 11, it says, for six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, the ceasing day, and he made it holy. That word holy means different or set apart. And so, and you can see that account there, Genesis chapter two. If you wanted to flip back, this is actually the, the account in Genesis chapter two. It says, but the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. And that makes sense. When I go outside and I work in my yard and I mow the grass and I trim the hedges and I do the stuff I'm doing, I'm sweaty, I'm hot. And I go inside and I want to sit on my couch and I want to drink a cold, sweet tea. And I want, and I, why? Because I'm tired and my work is done and it's finished and that makes sense that God would do that. He created everything and he's, and he's finished. The difference is God doesn't stop because he's tired. God doesn't get tired. Why does he stop? This is what we call the creation rhythm. And so this is kind of a, an idea that will help us understand Sabbath. When we follow Sabbath, when, when we see that he calls back to the creation story, he is following the creation rhythm. Six days of work, one day of ceasing and any time in scripture that we see something call back to an idea from creation, the creation rhythm, it's usually showing us that this thing is something that all creation should observe. Actually, if you, if you see it play out throughout the rest of scripture and how this concept of sevens, se six and then rest, six and do something different, There's, they did it with their land, they did it with uh, their debt, they did it with their slaves, they did it with so many different, they did it with their festivals. There was this big cycle of like, there's, there's six of go, 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 and then there's a seventh, which is stop. A beautiful, beautiful thing because it's part of the, the creation rhythm. God said, listen, here's what I created you to do. I created you to work hard, but then I also created you to take some time to just stop. Um, imagine a great sculptor from the Renaissance era, uh, someone like Michelangelo, okay, and you've got these great sculptings that they've done of, of the, I mean, immaculate human figures that look, uh, you know, just, just beautiful. And, but imagine one of those sculptors just getting to a point and he's like, you know what? I'm done sculpting. You get one more hit of the chisel and you break the nose off. You know, you make it look ridiculous. In the same way, uh, God is like a great artist. And a great artist, when he sees his work, he gets to a point where he realizes, that's enough. That's done. That's perfect. That's complete. Marty Solomon is a Bible teacher that I listen to on a podcast. He runs an organization called BaymaDiscipleship.org. Um, one, one thing he suggests about this, it says that, he said that we serve a God who knows when to say enough. And he invites us to join him in that rhythm. That we can see when there's enough. That we can see when God is providing and he's taking care and we can step back and go, that's good. And then when God steps back on that seventh day, he just enjoys the creation. And it's cool that he invites us to enjoy that with him. He said, listen, I got this. I got it under control. Why don't you take a day to step back and rest, to stop? Sabbath day was to be different. Like I said, that's what holy means. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Holy means 
to be set apart, to be different, to be identified as something that's like, it's different than the rest. These are the six days, but this day is different. It's a holy day. It's dedicated to God. And if you want to be refreshed and if you want to be more engaged with what God is doing in the world and you want to begin to live in the cycle that God created your human body to live in, he invites, follow my creation rhythm. Jump in on that. And that's the first thing we see as we, as we unpack Sabbath. And you can see that play out through the rest of Scripture. We don't have actually the time to unpack all the nuances of that. I'm going to give you a, a, de- a reference later to a podcast you might want to check out. It's got a lot of cool um, details. But that's the first thing. Why do we Sabbath? What's the point for us today? Well, we can follow God's creation rhythm. It helps us get in tune with what he's doing. Here's, here's the second thing. I told you that there's two times when the Ten Commandments are mentioned in the Bible. The second time is in Exodus, I mean, sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 5, okay? And, and you see the same Ten Commandments, and it's all the same stuff. Don't kill, don't steal, all that stuff. When we get to chapter 5, uh, verse 12, there it is again. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. As the Lord God has commanded you, six days you labor and do all your work. And the seventh day of the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons or daughters or your male and female servants, your ox, your donkey, any of your animals, any of your foreigners residing in your town so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. That all sounds the same as we just read. Okay, that's why I rushed through it. But then verse 15 happens. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. So this time, instead of calling back to the creation account, he calls back to something much more recent for the people that were listening. Uh, The people hearing the Ten Commandments for the first time right here in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Actually, this this is the second time, if you know the history. But the people who understand this and they're, they're, they're they're locally understanding, we were slaves in Egypt. I mean, they had just relatively recently been released from slavery. And in talking about the Sabbath and relating it to their slavery, he calls back to a time where he's like, do you remember slavery? Do you remember the endless labor? Do you remember that you were constantly having to make bricks to build things for Pharaoh? Do you remember it was grueling? There were no days off. There was no vacation. There was no appreciation for what you could do. There was no stopping. There was no rest. They were slaves in a culture that said there was never enough. And so who provides the more? The slaves. And God has freed them, it says, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And so this concept of a weekly day of rest, a Sabbath, was to serve as a reminder to these Jewish people. And so that they could remember, you are free. I want you to remember that you are free. And, and we might think, like, these guys, these guys probably don't need a reminder that they're free. Like, I mean, they were in slavery for 400 years. They probably wake up every day being like, sweet, we're not slaves anymore. But you and I both know this one thing about our human brains. We are quick to forget things. In fact, just shortly in that story, two times at least, the whole nation of Israel is like, we want to go back to Egypt and be slaves again. We don't like it out here. We had everything we needed in Egypt. So instead of trusting God, they would rather be slaves in Egypt. And so, yeah, they needed a reminder. And so God said, okay, once a week, I want you to take this day where you cease from your working, and what I want you to do is I want you to remember your freedom. I want you to celebrate your freedom. And this, too, is a reason why we, as modern Christ followers, need to celebrate Sabbath. Because we need to celebrate our freedom. Freedom from what? But first of all, and I say this tongue in cheek, but it's totally true. Working is slavery. I mean, we are slaves to our debt, to our mortgage, are we not? You ever feel the pressure to to get those bills paid? You ever feel the pressure to save for retirement? You feel the slavery of that nine to five, and maybe you're not the, the main boss at your job, so you feel that pressure of kind of this slave driver master over you, and maybe it's a nice guy, a nice lady that you work for. It's like, man, I gotta constantly please them. I gotta constantly do this. It's a form of slavery, and it overtakes us, but not only that, the early Christians, they began to gather on Sundays because for them, as they looked at the concept of Sabbath, they were like, well, man, Sunday was the day that the tomb was found empty. Let's take that day to celebrate God. And so they began to celebrate a different kind of freedom from a different kind of slavery. All throughout the New Testament, sin is called a slavery. We become slaves to our sin. If you ever had an addiction or something that just draws you that simple, you know that it's a slavery. It is always knocking on your shoulder, being like, hey, come over here. Let me show you something. 
Let me show you something. Hey, you want to buy a watch? You know what I mean? Like there's always some kind of sin pulling us in. And it's a slavery. And so when we take one day out of our week and simply set it aside to say, whew, God, you set me free. We can use a Sabbath time to celebrate freedom. And it's bigger than that. Oh, it's so much bigger than that. Okay, check this out. So you got the two pictures, okay? You got the, 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 the Exodus passage. Sabbath is great for, uh, for celebrating the, the creation rhythm and, and seeing that there's time that our bodies just need to rest and we can step back and we can trust God and we can enjoy creation. You got the Deuteronomy passage where it calls back to this idea of slavery and that even as a modern day Christ follower, we can use this time to celebrate the freedom that God gives, but this, it's even deeper than that. Let me tell you, it's, it's so much deeper than that. Because not only does the Sabbath allow us to celebrate the past, what God has already done for us. Thank you, God, for the, the provision. Thank you for the freedom. Thank you for all those things. It is also something that helps us in the present. Because in the present, we get to find a mindset of worship. In the pr- present, we actually get to find this physical rest. Like, I mean, like, you know, you wake up after a nap and you're like... Wow, that was good, right? It's the present. But here's the most beautiful part. It is also a practicing for the future. Because imagine this. God creates the heavens and the earth, and it's perfect, and it's beautiful, and he creates this Eden-like state. Adam and Eve are there. It's beautiful. It's the way God intended it to be. But sin comes into the world. And when sin comes into the world, and we begin to have to work as part of our penance for sin, there's this constant need to provide. There's this constant need to sustain. But God says this, listen. Here's the deal. One day, you won't have to work anymore. One day, if you are following me, if you put your faith in my son Jesus, you won't have to get up and do your nine to five or your night shift or whatever thing that drags you down. One day, there's going to be a day where you're just not going to wake up with achy joints and arthritis and a sore back. And, and, and I'm frustrated because I don't like the people that work next to me. One day, there's this day. And so Sabbath is this practice session for eternity with Jesus. You know, Scripture teaches us that when we are in heaven, that we will be in the presence of God and we will not be able to help but to worship him. Like, you're just there. It, it's like, you remember the videos of those, those little girls at the Beatles concerts? Or more recently, I don't even know who's cool anymore. One Direction was like five, ten years ago. Who's, who's in, I don't know, some Korean pop band, whoever it is, okay? And they're like, ah! Like when we're in God's presence, I, we totally get giddy. And we're like, there he is. He's the creator. That's the creator of the universe. All I want to do right now is give him glory. And do you know every time that you worship, it is practice for heaven. Every time. Every time, thank you God for this. Every time we sing a song, every time you get one of those moments in your heart, you're like, oh, that was good. It's practicing for being fully in the presence of God. And in Sabbath, you can prepare yourself for that. And once a week, you can remind yourself, this isn't lasting forever. The pain, the hurt, the fear, the struggle, the constant chasing for more, it will not last forever. That's what Sabbath does for us for the future. God says, I want you to set aside a day for me to stop and to worship me and to rest and remember what I've done for you. And while you do that, look towards the future. And know what I've got prepared for you. I don't know about you, but in my life, I start every week with this, 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 this list of blank squares. I call it my calendar. I've got an app. My wife uses paper and a pen. Mine sinks to the cloud. I think it's better. <laughs> you got a calendar, right? Now, here's the thing. We look at this thing, and I want to give you a reality. Okay, I'm going to set you free right now. That calendar is yours. It's yours. Your time is a possession that God gave you. All right? It doesn't feel that way because other people are constantly filling up your calendar. Your kids have 15 soccer games tomorrow, like on the same day. That's just one kid. If you got more than one kid, it's 30 soccer games. Like your 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 boss fills up your calendar. Granted, you signed up to work for them and and your sports team and your favorite tv show they fill up your calendar and holidays of course fill up the calendar and the government fills up the calendar and everything begins to fill up but here's the reality all of that is optional when you get right down to it okay you can make a lot of choices in your life to a large degree your time is your property to a large degree there are certain things like okay listen if i don't work that's irresponsible right but there are large portions of your time that are totally your property to do with whatever you want I want you to listen to this sentence. I think it's on the screen, and I want you to kind of break it down in your mind. You might want to write it down. It's something to really think. You're going to need a couple days to think on this. Keeping Sabbath as part of our weekly rhythm 
is A, one of the most sacrificial acts of worship that we can make in our busy schedules. And B, it's the acceptance of the sovereignty of God. We talk a lot about our possessions. Normally we think about our money and our stuff. What's really one of the most limited and valuable resources you have in your life? Your time. You don't get it back. You got five bucks you don't want to spend now, you can save it and spend it later. You got five minutes you don't want to use now, sorry, it's gone. And when we decide to start setting aside time to invest in our relationship with God, it is one of the most deep, can we put that just back on the screen and just leave it there? You can just leave it there for a little while. It's one of the most deep and meaningful acts of worship that we can do for our God. And it's an acceptance of his sovereignty. It's saying, God, you know what? Everything else that's fighting for my time it comes in second place to you. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you this time. And you know what it means? It means, you ready for this? It's going to hurt. It means saying no to some things. The only way to make time in our schedule for something else that you're not already doing is to say no to something else. Period. And it hurts, and it's hard. But if you're looking for a way to really grow your relationship with God, and he's like, look, you can toss me like peanut shells every now and then, or you can give me some valuable stuff. Like, how about an hour of your time? (laughs) Something beautiful happens when we stop. This beautiful thing happens when we stop. When we cease trying to be the center of the universe, when we pause to realize that my work is not the center of the universe, and when we take a break to see that my work is not keeping all this going, it's not the glue holding the world together, when we take that intentional time to stop and step back, we get to reset, we get to reprioritize, and ultimately we get to worship. Sabbath is that intentional step. And, and, and I got to confess, okay, I try my, honest, my best to be as honest and transparent as I can. And I got to confess, I have been pretty bad at taking Sabbath myself recently. I have. There's been seasons in my life when we're better and we're worse. And, and, but for the last two or three weeks, honestly, uh, I've been a little bit convicted because I knew I had to preach this sermon. And I don't want to be a total hypocrite. <laughs> so I'm like, I got I to gotta really try to work this back into my life more. And for me, um, Sunday, it's hard to make Sunday that time for me. Um, I'm the preacher at a church plant. And that's, that's a lot. I got a million things on my mind. One of them is I love to get to spend the personal time with so many of you just here in this room. This is the time where we get to cross paths easily once a week, and that's awesome. And then it goes on all day until youth group's over at the end of the day. And then, to be honest, I'm a big football fan, and I'm I'm selfish with that sometimes. And, and, you know, like all these things. So for me, I found, you know what, because my schedule is flexible in this way, for about the last three or four weeks, I've been trying to take Monday as that day for me. And again, it's not a whole 24 hours. It hasn't been for me, but it's really been a time where I've been like, I'm going to step back. I'm just going to intentionally take it slow. And I've been doing some specific things, spending time with my family and being sure to spend time in God's word and read things that are encouraging and pray. And, and man, it has made such a big difference in my personal life in just the last two or three weeks. And I should know better. But it's easy because it's never enough. You got to constantly go, go, go. Do more, make more, be more. And God says, no, no, no. I've made enough. I've already made enough. You need to rest in that. So there's so much more to be said. I want to give you a resource, and I want to give you four kind of uh, tips, because I think we, all of us, can put this practice in our life. Here's the first resource, okay? There's a great uh, ministry called The Bible Project, thebibleproject.com. They have some really awesome videos on YouTube. All their resources are free, and they are scholarly, and they are deep, and they are meaningful. And they are like nine sessions in right now on their podcast, and I think they're all about an hour long. So they're about nine hours in to discussing the value of Sabbath and what it can mean in our cycle of life. And when I was writing this sermon, I was like, man, what can I, and then I, I came on this podcast, I listened to two of them, and I was like, holy cow, this is a lot of resource. So if you really want to kind of dig in and have something to kind of bite into, uh, look, this would be a great thing to get your New Year's resolution going. Uh, the Bible Pro- Podcast, uh, thebibleproject.com. Uh, it's on all the podcast players, or you can go find it on their website. You're smart. You can figure that out. All right, so that, that's one thing. If you need a link for that, let me know, and I'll be glad to send it to you. The second thing is this. I want to give us four tips, some ideas to get started on, on, on making Sabbath rest part of our cycle, okay? And so let me just run through them because I think these are, these are simple enough, but they're going to be hard. So write them down and then practice, okay? Number one, start with small blocks. 
Start with small blocks. In the world you live in today, in the cycle that you have, there's a really good chance that you don't already have 24 hours where you're not doing something else. There's a really good chance. So my advice is to start with small box. And, and maybe you don't even get a day off of work. Like maybe you're working today. You got a few hours off to come to church. And this is your Sabbath, and that's good. Here's what I encourage you to do. Pick a portion of your day where you know you have some downtime. Hopefully you get a lunch time, at least half an hour, maybe an hour. And take a real lunch break. Okay? I'm not talking about a multitask lunch break. I'm not talking about where you schedule a meeting during lunch so that you can. No, I'm talking about like you, you eat your food and then you Sabbath. A lot of things you can do during that time. That's something that you can develop. It's not, it's not about how you do it. It's about that you understand the purpose behind it. Okay? Try that. Small blocks. And then maybe for you, you're like, well, okay, I also get off at 5. I got something to do till 6.30. But actually, around 7, I just veg out on, um, on Netflix. Okay, this goes to step two. Unplug. Unplug. This is a more modern piece of advice because we never unplug. I found out this week, I was, I was really just fit, realizing I was spending more time on social media than I was in the Bible. And I was like, that's, that's ridiculous. Um, you know, Facebook and Instagram aren't going to save my soul. I, I really need to make sure I'm in the word completely. And so while we are doing that, it takes some intentional unplugging. So something I've been trying to do for the last several days, and I've been doing it for years, and it goes off and on, but I get to a point in my daily routine where I want to take my phone, I want to put it in my bedroom and plug it up for tomorrow, and I walk away. And it's going to look different for different people, but unplug. I highly recommend a straight-up fast from social media if that's grabbing your attention too often. Put it down. Have real conversations with people. That's unplugged. Next one is this, and it goes right into that thing I just said. Engaged with loved ones, engage with loved ones. Uh, one part of our Sabbath rest is that we get to be with people. It's awesome. We get to be with people, the people you live with, your friends, but do it in a real way. Uh, yesterday, uh, my family and I did something cool. Actually, not before last, we set up our Christmas tree together, and that's neat. He's, that's something you do with people. And then uh, yesterday, we went to the board game cafe where Phil works, plug for a board, uh, sideboard board game cafe on Oleander. It was pretty awesome. Um, we played three board games, and my family doesn't play board games a lot, and it was a lot of fun. We were unplugged. We were spending time together. And in my heart, I didn't even tell my family this. I was like, this is Sabbath for me. I'm not, I'm, I hadn't finished writing this sermon yet, honestly. And there was that tension. Look, do I need to practice Sabbath or write a sermon about Sabbath? <laughs> I said, no, I'm almost done. I can wrap it up tonight. Let's spend time with the family. Spend time with loved ones. That is part of what God gives us the gift to do. The fourth tip, worship personally and corporately. That's part of what we're doing today. Corporately as a group, the body, and personally. We gotta be reading our Bibles. We gotta be praying. And that stuff is not supposed to happen in isolation. It's supposed to happen in community. In the early church, people didn't have cell phone Bibles apps they, would, they had maybe one copy of a letter or some Old Testament, and then one person would read it to the whole group, and they would discuss, discuss it as a group. In fact, the reading of Scripture was a major part of their gathering, and this idea of being in God's Word is a huge part of our worship to Him. But prayer and singing songs, and I love some of the Jewish practices in Sabbath. They would sing together as a family. You can turn on Spotify or K-Love or some Christian radio, and, and you can be in that setting, and you can worship because... Worship is about stopping, about ceasing, and about acknowledging that God is enough. And when you're too tired or you're too busy to worship or to pray or to rest or to spend time with your family or to have intimacy with your spouse or to be neighborly to your neighbor or to be content or to have time for your kids or to have joy or to have peace, it's time for you to stop. You don't need a three-day weekend. You need time with the creator. I intentionally planned this sermon for today. All year long, I've been looking forward to it. Because this is the season where we try to be as busy as humanly possible. Followed by next season, where we try to be as busy as humanly possible, which is then we have spring, which is where we be busy as humanly possible. And then, of course, the busy summer. And when summer slows down, we can finally have fall when school starts and we can be as busy as humanly possible. Stop. And let's be a church that practices Sabbath. And I believe that it will enhance your relationships. It will enhance your marriages. It will enhance your parenting. It will enhance your work. Because then you can go back on Monday 
And you can say, oh, God, I'm here to work for you. I'm here to serve my purpose. I'm here to walk in your footsteps. Pray about it. Be intentional about your space. Be careful with your yeses and your noes. And Sabbath, you can do it. Let's pray together this morning.